Coming up on Techzilla, digital cameras. Thinking about buying one? CNS Lori Grunin's back to talk about the latest and best deals in digital cameras. Wondering about the best way to charge your cell phone? We're going to tell you. And how about erasing hard drives in bulk? We're going to show you how to do it on the cheap. And of course, we got a big old stack of your viewer questions. So pull out the celery sticks and slap on the peanut butter because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by GoToAssist Express. Support smarter with GoToAssist Express. Gamefly. Go to Gamefly.com slash Techzilla for your free trial membership. And Squarespace.com, a great place to build a great website. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you've already got. Whether you're a beginner, tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech <laughs> or the best berries to go with homemade ice cream, we've got an answer for you. Or at least Serafina does. Does she? Well, if we're talking about the whole berry thing, Serafina is the resident expert mm. on berry tracking and making. Really? Yes. I did not know this. Yeah, all she has to do is go out in your front yard and shake a bush. Ah, uh, living in the country. In the country, yeah, Walnut Creek. And by country, country, I mean Walnut Creek. <laughs> <laughs> Our apologies if you had trouble downloading last week's show or found your format of choice had voice sync issues. Uh, we had massive server glitch that did awful things to our finished version and killed the Final Cut Pro project, so we couldn't render it out again. Yes, I, like I'd worst also... worst-case scenario. Really, it was one of those cascading crashes of stupidity along with... There was also sort of an internal, uh, unfortunate erasing mistake and things got ugly. Well, I also want to thank Apple for their spectacular enterprise-level support for their servers and, and sending Revision 3 a dead server, the one we bought new that was going to replace the one that died anyway. That was cool. Was yeah. Kind of, that was awesome. <laughs> Open the box, get it out, because it's Friday night, it's midnight, you're going to spend the whole weekend rebuilding stuff. Way to go, Apple. On the less snarky side of things, something wonderful happened this weekend. I got a flurry of text messages from a buddy of mine. <laughs> no big deal, right? Except he was actually using a speech-to-text application on his cell phone, and the messages weren't garbled crap. Really? That's a big deal to me. Like, somebody actually talking to their phone and me getting an actual message that, that looks was like... Was it like, what kind, of, what kind of software was it? Oddly enough, um, he was, he was using Android 2.2 and mm -hmm. the Google Voice Search application, which nice. is built in. Now, Daniel did say it was, you know, talking like a robot from a 1950s science fiction movie, send text to Patrick uh, works best. But the fact that, I mean, think about, like, think about, like, Google Voice, like somebody calls you a message and it sends you an email that's like, Ryan wants me to pick up what? <laughs> and then you call up and yell at Ryan for asking you to pick up something that's illegal in 47 states. Um, but you know what I mean? Like those, the, I, just, I just think it's exciting when voice to speech actually works like something that doesn't make you want to weep because you have to spend your entire afternoon correcting what it didn't do right in the first place. Yeah, I have, I have big trouble with it usually. Whenever <laughs> I try to do it, my messages come out terrible. But I do <laughs> like to try to try to translate what Google Voice is telling me. Hey, Daniel also suggests you, uh, if you run an Android, you reinstall your favorite apps from the App Store, even if they come pre-installed on the operating system, because that's the only way he seems to be actually getting the updates and the information on the updates. Interesting, I hadn't yeah. heard that before. I, just sharing. All right. Just saying, we're not all iPhone here. Sometimes we're Android. Sometimes. Let's Sometimes. get some questions on. It's a speed round. Andy writes in, Dear Patrick and Veronica, why don't any mobile devices have a solar cell built in for charging? Is this a surface area issue? If so, why don't manufacturers provide a solar cell adapter to accompany the wall AC-DC transformer? My girlfriend says this solution would be awkward, but I think it would work fine for traveling by bus or out walking. The solar cell hanging from the backpack, perhaps. Uh. Andy in Burnsville. Minnesota? The great, no, it's just the great solar cell hanging from the backpack myth. More happy little campers have been pissed off by finding themselves in the woods with a dead cell phone and a not charged battery on their little solar adapter. Here's the thing though, to go back to the first part of your question, cell phones are designed to be cheap. Solar cells aren't cheap. And until like, let's say, I don't know, Apple decides to put a solar cell on the back of this because, you know, that's the whole reason they went flax. They're going to turn it into a solar cell in the second generation, right? Um, you know what I mean? Like, there's, unless everybody's going like solar. market adoption exactly. of the whole thing, of the whole technology. It's, it's just too expensive. It's too expensive to put them on there. They charge too slow. It takes too long. Solar cell efficiency, I mean, if, if the sun is there, you basically want the solar cell 
pointed directly at the sun. And as the sun moves, you want your solar cells to move with the sun, which, you know, putting it down like that, not so good. By the way, if there's a shadow over part of it, the efficiency drops through the floor. If the sun's over there and the thing's pointing here like it's on your backpack and bouncing, which makes it even worse, you're gonna charge even less. So solar cells aren't particularly efficient unless you actually have a position where you're getting lots of sun. Like if you're in Phoenix and you've got like tracking or a big wide open space to put your solar cell in, it'll work great if it's stationary. Um, I mean, you could totally build your own portable charger. Part of his email was like, can I buy these parts from Radio Shack? Yeah, just, um, you know, if you're disciplined, it'll work okay. Just don't throw it in the back of your backpack and expect to have a charge if you've been playing movies all day. And you want a lot more capacity on the solar charging side than you actually think you need because solar cells aren't efficient. And if there's a shadow, they're even less efficient. And if they're not pointing at the sun, they're even less efficient. Uh, check out the reviews online of portable stuff from Brunton and Solio, like REI and Eastern Mountain Sports and all these other places that are like, I'm a yeah. big backpacker and I'm all freaking green. And people are like, I spent $100 for this and it never charged my phone. <laughs> Except when I put it on a rock on my trip to Phoenix and it charged for six hours and that allowed then, me to run my iPhone for half And then my capacity. phone next to it melted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Overheated and never worked again. I hate that thought. Yeah, you'll find a lot of frustrated people that thought they'd be as simple as plugging into a wall and they're not. I love that you just said, I hate that thought. <laughs> Usually it's I love that thought. No, I like that thought. Yeah, I like that thought. So I hate that thought. You just spun it around. That's great. I got a bunch of tweets about <laughs> my phrase of the week. We've all got phrases. It happens. Yeah, I just tend to abuse them more than most people. Mark writes in, hey, Petronica. That's a first. It's like a bottle of tequila with attitude. I work with an organization that takes computer donations and refurbishes them to give to people in need. We always securely wipe all the drives before we reload them in a new PC, but this is a time-consuming process. We currently use D-Band on a bootable CD. Here's the problem. We have hundreds of loose IDE drives that need to be wiped. Can you recommend a method of securely wiping the drives without having to install them one by one in a PC? I know there are commercial bulk drive erasers, but they cost thousands of dollars and we're on a shoestring budget. Budget. Any creative ideas? Thanks. Loves the show. Mark. Interns. Yes. <laughs> Interns can do anything. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> it is. It is a valuable use of. And I, I do so enjoy bossing around interns. If you can see, right you can't Ian. see Ian behind the camera right now, but he's cringing. He's kind of waving like great. Oh, I torture him so. On a more serious note, yes, uh, both hard drive shredders. Watch this video. and professional degaussing equipment are expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to see if there's a local drive or data destruction service that will donate these services to your organization. Or uh, you can try something we found online posted at tomshardware.com by a person named Aster. Get yourself a super strong neodymium magnet from a shop like kjmagnetics.com. Aster claims less than 30 seconds of circular rubbing made the data on his, I just it's see like you in the corner of my sheep. eye. <laughs> it made the data on his 3.5 inch drives unusable. And we all know that. Having magnets yeah. in your bag with your laptop or any other tech device are probably not. The a old great classic, idea. like I put the backup on the refrigerator with the magnet on the, you know, the floppy disk drive. That's a terrible, I've, I've had family members a terrible do this. idea, yes. It's terrible. Basically, you need a stupid strong magnet that the, the neodymium ones are the easiest ones to get a hold of. And you do this on the section of the hard drive that has the platters. And this would be another good thing for, for interns to do. But, you know, check it on a few drives, Excellent. see if it works. Oh my goodness, yeah. Yeah, can you imagine doing this for eight hours a day, all day? Maybe everybody could be required to do like five drives before They'd they leave the like building at the end of the ship. by the end of the day, or like RSI or something. Well, maybe you, you make a machine. Okay, let's let's not build machines at the moment. That would be a system episode. I love that you later. just went like build a huge machine to no, no, rub no, no, magnets like, on your drives all no, day. No, you could actually like have a little thing. That the oh, drive you know what you could do? You could do a um, if you had some kind of um, what's it? Uh, um, pendulum. A pendulum. If you had a pendulum with a magnet stuck to the bottom of it, and, and then just, just had of... it swing over the same spot all day, mm -hmm. that would work, right? Possibly, as long as it covered all of the. Platter. She needs like I the had whole to do my platter. That's a pretty good robot arm. And notice the guns on Veronica Belmont, people. I don't know why we've been gun obsessed lately. I've been working out. Yeah. Um, so what would you suggest? I, I, I say I'm, I'm going with the magnet route. The magnet route. I would go for asking people for donations of drive wiping services. That, that would be the smart personally. way to go. Ooh, okay, ask for drive wiping services, then get a neodymium magnet and see if that works for you, or. If you have a local foundry, see if they'll melt them into a giant pile. Just remove the printed circuit board before you melt them. They're really easy to melt because most of it's aluminum, and then you end up with aluminum with steel bedded in. And that and would just, be fun. And you can end up with a really cool doorstop yeah. or... All right.
right. boat anchor. Well, let's do one last question from Jonathan in Tampa. I'm looking at getting a 24 or 27 inch HP or Asus computer monitor. Both sizes have the same native resolution, 1920 by 1080. Does this mean the 27 inch monitor has the same amount of screen real estate as the 24 inch monitor? <laughs> Which size would you recommend for mostly office work with a little gaming mixed in? Jonathan in Tampa, Florida. Yes to real estate. I mean, essentially, right? You have the same 1920 by 1080. That's the pixel count, horizontal and vertical. No, horizontal and vertical. Yeah, that would yeah. be horizontal. That would be vertical. I mean, everything would still <laughs> yes. look the same. Yes. Yeah, basically, the pixels are going to be bigger on the 27-inch yeah. monitor. Uh, and the 27-inch monitors also tend to be stupid expensive. Stupid expensive. Or for a lower price 27-inch monitor, you can spend like $500 on a 27, like $300 on a 27-inch monitor. Probably means you're getting crappy glass compared to a 300 or $400 uh, 24-inch monitor. Dude, get a Dell. Actually, I, yeah, I mean, that's one thing. They get. The Dells, the Dells are really nice. Uh, HP, Asus makes nice. Samsung, I'm really into that. Mostly, I buy Samsung and Dell monitors for computers. Those have been my two choices in the I've last. I've been using five Dells years. forever. Yeah. And they've always worked great for me. I use them for gaming. I use them for work. It's fine. Yeah, I and would. And they'll usually run you a little less than mo most of the other big name brands. <laughs> Especially if you go to the Dell outlet. Yeah. Because Dells, they're making them in bulk, man. Um, I would probably go with the 24-inch monitor. Because the, I, with the 27-inch, I want more pixels, and it, you just don't run into higher-resolution monitors because everybody's into the whole 1080p thing. I wonder if the if the 30-inch has a higher native resolution. I think it. The 30-inch is like a down payment on a car. That's my only well, concern the, yeah. for that. <laughs> when I find one for an like, Apple 30-inch cinema display would be like a down payment on a nice car. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about buying a new digital camera, you're going to love our next guest, Lori Grunin, Senior Editor for Digital Cameras and Camcorders at CNET.com. Boy, we've got your attention. Let's talk about Gamefly, people. Gamefly.com is the largest online video game rental service. They offer you a choice from over 7,000 new and classic titles on pretty much every console and handheld. Plans start at $15.95 a month, and you, you only if you're a Gamefly member, can rent one to four games at a time, keep them for as long as you like, play them until your fingers bleed. No late fees, no due dates, shipping is always free. You're done playing a game, you send it back, Gamefly sends you the next available game on your list. Sounds like another service we use a lot around here. If you really like the game you're playing, click Keep It on the Gamefly website. The game is yours at a discounted price. Gamefly is even going to mail you the case and manuals free of charge. Now, if you're a Texilla fan, you can score a 15-day free trial, but only if you go to Gamefly.com slash Texilla. Hey, do us a favor here at Texilla. Keep the show coming. Support our sponsors by trying out places like Gamefly.com slash Texilla. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, food spotting. Who doesn't love food porn? A lot of us are already photographing our extra special meals, or even the more mundane ones, and posting the images on Flickr, Facebook, and Twitter. But did you know there's a whole community out there on the internet who share the same passion for good eats as you do? Allow me to introduce you to Food Spotting, a social network filled with people who love sharing their special food moments with the world. Using the iPhone app or the website, an Android app is coming soon, foodies can upload images, select which foods get the coveted NOM badge, and mark things they want to try out themselves later from the other users. It does have a bit of a game aspect as well. You can follow some guides created by other users or special partners like the Travel Channel, for example, and try to spot all the food on the list. For example, if you're a huge Anthony Bourdain fan, you can get his guide of all the great things he tried in San Francisco and recreate his trip yourself. The more foods you spot and the more appealing those foods are to users, the more tips you'll receive. The more tips you get, the more noms you can dole out to other users, noms of course being the highest form of food lust. So stop bugging your Twitter followers with what you had for breakfast and share it with a community that really cares at foodspotting.com. Back to school, fall foliage. You know what? I think it's time to get CNET Senior Editor for Digital Imaging back on the show to talk about what's new in the world of digital cameras. Welcome back, Lori Gruden. How are you doing today, Lori? I'm doing fine. Glad to be here. It's uh, it's been like we'll be here. Um, here. Sorry. We're, we're, you're on the show. That counts as here. It's a metaphor. Uh, uh, so uh, Sony, Canon, Panasonic, Nikon, Samsung, Olympus ton of announcements this this summer uh, and is it is it me or they're like two big trends mirrorless interchangeable lens camera systems is that is that the future of prosumers are, are we getting away from the classic big giant lenses from Canon and Nikon I think ultimately uh, it's it's a future 
Mm-hmm. I don't think digital SLRs are going to disappear anytime soon, but I think they'll probably start to replace the high-end point-and-shoots. Okay. Uh, especially as they get faster, like the, Sony, the new Sony's uh, incorporate phase detection AF, which is the faster autofocus system. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same autofocus system used by SLRs, and that provides the speed that a lot of point-and-shoot upgraders are looking for that they don't get with the other uh, interchangeable lens cameras. What do you think of the, the kind of the second big trend we were seeing this summer? It seems like hybrid digital cameras, SLR, HD camcorder things. Uh, like filmmakers the are starting to use. is a great way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but like you see, like, you know, there's everybody's like, oh, we shot this episode of Insert Television Show here with a Canon 5 Mark III, or there's a Panasonic's a GH1. <laughs> I mean, do you see this as being an actual shift in the industry or just like a PR attention grabbing fad kind of thing? Uh, uh, it's sort of a combination of both. Uh, the thing that people are really in love with is the flexibility that the large sensor offers Mm -hmm. with the interchangeable lenses to control what the image on um, the recorded image looks like. Mm -hmm. That's something that's really, really hard to do with the really expensive traditional video equipment. Mm -hmm. So they're going through that, that, that loving phase that you always get when something become you know when this enabling technology comes along. Did you know the um, red camera will allow me to do everything with a five thousand dollar camera, <laughs> and then you find that it's a five thousand dollar box with no handles, and you need a five thousand dollar lens and a five thousand dollar viewing well, it's system. A, it's a similar <laughs> it's a similar thing for all the SLRs that do video. It's it's basically what you're buying is the sensor and the lens mount, and then you have to to buy all these expensive rigs right. to go around them so that you can focus and the, the, so you can hold it steady. And, uh, you know, these are things that the, the really, you know, the enthusiasts and the indie filmmakers are into. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll spend the money and, you know, they think it's really a challenge. But for, you know, mainstream people who just want to be able to point and shoot the video, it's, it's really hard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so you basically at this uh, point the, the the digital SLRs with the HD video. I mean, even at the even at the kind of like the, the the pocket point and shoot cameras. Do you think the HD video on that's good enough to replace having both a camera and a camcorder? Um, mm, no. The thing about camcorders is they can record longer things. For instance, school plays. You mm-hmm. can't do that with a pocket cam- uh, pocket camera. They're ten- generally limited to short clips. There's still some drawbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of the way you, you know, camcorders are designed to be held a certain way that you can't really hold the point and shoot cameras. They're 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 still struggling on uh-huh. what the 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 convergence device will look like and feel like and operate like. That's why it's it's really the um, I think eventually prosumer camcorders will have large sensors and interchangeable lenses but i have no idea what it's <laughs> what they're finally going to look like right. and cost well let's let's move on to a, a happier subject it's a great time <laughs> well if you think about it, right buying like, things <laughs> buying things and well think about how much camera you get like 100 150 bucks say you're looking for the what's your what's your best what's your favorite pick for a budget point and shoot right now um, got a few actually. The Sony um, W350 mm-hmm. is a nice, uh, you know, under under one hundred and seventy five dollars or so. Um, the Canon PowerShot SD twelve hundred, uh, about you know, about uh, one hundred and seventy five also. Mm-hmm. Um, they're good. They're not terribly fast, and they're not you know they don't deliver great low light image quality, mm-hmm. but. For you know, budget point and shoots, they're small, they're well designed, and and generally people are happy with them. What's your favorite high end point and shoot? Uh, at the moment, I probably have to say the Canon S90. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as you know, they announced the S95 <laughs> this week, which is basically the same thing. It just has some upgraded video. Um, uh, there are some models that I'm looking forward to trying that I haven't yet, which uh, like the um, Panasonic LX5. Uh, the um, we just got the Sony, uh, sorry, not Sony, Samsung TL500. Those are all competitors in that class, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm I haven't gotten a chance to try either one of those yet. But for now, the one that I like the best that I've used is the Sony S90. Well, let's talk about uh, DSLRs, budget, high end. Okay. What are, What are your favorites? You know, do you like the, judging from what we said before? It sounds like you're more into the budget DSLRs than the interchangeable lens cameras. Uh, that's not necessarily true. 
Um, but I think the thing is the budget SLRs are actually cheaper mm -hmm. than the interchangeable lens equivalents. And, and as I said, they're better for shooting a lot of the things that people want to that people who buy them want to shoot. For the money, the Pentax KX, mm -hmm. which I believe you can get with, you know, a single lens kit for under five hundred dollars. Wow. Uh, I think don't uh, don't trust my memory, but it's <laughs> it's relatively cheap, um, and it's fast, and it has good low light, and uh, you know the colors are a little off. That's my only real complaint about mm -hmm. it. Uh, but most people won't notice them the way I do. I'm kind of picky about that. Uh, but so, yeah, for budget SLRs, I think probably the Pentax KX. How about and the it comes in so many colors. <laughs> colorful, colorful cameras. Yeah, How about the high end? In, the high end, you want to wait a little bit. Ooh. I think there's, pro I mean, there's probably some announcements coming between now and Photokina mm -hmm. and and depending upon how much you're planning spent by after Photokina. <laughs> so this is this isn't a good time to to pick your, you know, twelve hundred dollar plus SLR. If you've been waiting you really for the five D you might want to wait another six weeks. <laughs> well, I see yeah, I don't know I have no idea when to expect a five D replacement. Certainly it's starting to get old and the com competition's creeping up on it and um so, but, you know, it, in a photo keen a year, there's usually lots of new announcements. <laughs> so I, I'd hold off until probably after the show and then, and then make a choice. Lori Grunin, ladies and gentlemen, you can find her stuff up at CNET.com. Lori, will you come back a little closer to Black Friday? Give us the tips for the best buys around then, going into the holiday shopping I will. season. Lori, thank you so of much. Ladies and gentlemen, coming Thank up next, you. we're going to be talking about HDMI and getting it out of DisplayPort devices. But first, let's thank one of our sponsors. Providing in-person technical support for your clients or colleagues is expensive and time-consuming. But there's an easy, cost-effective way to do it all online with GoToAssist Express from Citrix. GoToAssist Express lets you easily view and control any other computer online so you can quickly resolve technical issues without being there in person. Whether you're in customer support, technical consulting, management, or just a computer guru, GoToAssist Express will help you increase revenue, reduce travel and support time, and service more clients. Try GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. For this special offer, you must visit GoToAssist.com slash Texilla. That's GoToAssist.com slash Texilla for a free trial. And since GoToAssist Express is all about computer help from a distance, we're going to see if we can help out someone remotely. And that someone is our very own Martini, Revision 3's Director of Programming. So what seems to be ailing your machine today, Martini? You know, for a MacBook Pro, I would just figure it would run a little quicker. I find it to stall a lot, especially when I'm in Firefox. There's just a lot mm -hmm. of thinking going on, and I don't understand why since most of my content is kept on a hard drive. Okay. Well, the first thing we want to do is try to see if you have a lot of applications or widgets that are running. Do you use widgets a lot? Do you have a lot that run in the background here? Let's take a look at your dashboard. No, oh, not I'm too not, bad. Yeah. You're pretty standard. I'm not that computer savvy, but I know I've uploaded a ton of applications. On computer. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got Firefox open and, of course, go to Assist Express. So that doesn't seem to be the trouble right now. Um, but for future reference, even if an app looks closed, it might not be. Check with your activity monitor to see if any applications are unresponsive and close down the ones that are using up an unusual amount of memory. Have you used activity monitor before? Probably to force quit. So I'm going to. Um, sort this by real memory and it looks like yeah pretty normal right now nothing is really standing out to me too much um, sometimes Adobe Air apps like TweetDeck for example use a lot of real memory and that can slow things down pretty significantly so if you see that starts uh, using up a lot of memory you might just want to shut that one down for a little while and you know start it back up to clear things out okay all right so next up uh, have you repaired your disk permissions recently uh, definitely not. All right. If you haven't repaired your disk permissions in a while, give that a shot. It's basically a quick tune-up that'll help make sure there's no errors on your hard drive. So you pop open Disk Utility, and then you mm -hmm. click on your drive, and then right there at the bottom, it's Repair Disk Permissions. So that's just going to put things back in their right places and make sure that your computer knows where to find the files it's looking for. And you should see a pretty noticeable speed boost if you haven't done repair permissions before. Do you know what your startup items are? Like what applications jump up as soon as you open up your computer? Uh, I don't. I know that ADM pops up, but other okay. than that, 
I don't really know. When your computer boots up, uh, you can tell it to automatically open up certain applications that you use, like Adium, for example. Um, sometimes applications add themselves to this list without your realizing it. And to see which apps are being opened on startup, you want to go to your accounts under system preferences. And we can look at your login items. And yeah, you're actually not too bad. So these are the things that will start automatically when your computer boots up. Um, if you don't need ADM to pop up right away, like if you're just starting up your computer to do some word processing or to check your email real fast, you know, taking ADM off of that list might not be a bad idea. And to do that, you don't necessarily have to. You would just select it and then click that minus button there. And that will okay, take it cool. out of your, your items. So I'm assuming the other stuff that I've never heard of, I could probably take off. Um, well, do you use a, 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 a Palm device? No. Currently? OK, yeah, you definitely don't need that. Okay. We'll leave iCal. Trans Snaps Pro X? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> That's for ripping video. <laughs> All right. We'll take those two off. Okay. And that might give you a little help. And finally, like I mentioned, you want to make sure you clean off your desktop, your hard drive, and all those extra fonts on there. Maybe it's time for a quick spring cleaning, perhaps. Do you have a lot of stuff on your desktop? Let's take a look. That's the one thing I've done because everyone cleaned it off. told me that was the issue. Yeah, so I took everything off. I put everything in a hard drive. That's great. So all your photos yeah. and videos that you don't need all the time? Yep, I took everything and put it on an external hard drive. Excellent, because what the operating system is doing, it has to it has to not only know where all those shortcuts and links are, but it also has to make icons for everything mm -hmm. on your desktop, and that's going to use up some, some RAM. And if you're mm -hmm. running under 20 gigabytes of hard drive space, that could also be slowing things down. So like you said, move your videos, your fo folders, everything onto an external hard drive. That way it doesn't have to deal with all that data on there. Do you remember how much total space your, your hard drive has? I don't. Let's find out. Well, it looks like you probably had a 100 gigabyte hard drive when you first started, and now you're down to less than five gigabytes. So you've oh got God. a lot of stuff on there. <laughs> and I thought I cleaned everything off. <laughs> well, what you can do That's is hiding in there. I know it's hiding behind all those little in those little dark corners of your computer. Um, if you want to use a piece of software like uh, Disk Inventory X, that'll actually show you what kinds of file types are taking up space on your computer, and then you can oh. kind of click through there and find out which ones you want to dump or move to an external hard drive. Um, but there's also some software that I wanted to recommend to you that will help clean up things in the future. Um, okay. One of them is called Cocktail. It will do all those nitty gritty things that will help speed up your system and just make it run a lot more efficiently. And then there's another piece of software that I really love called Xlimmer. And what this does is take those big, big packages that are applications on your Mac, like things like you know, Photoshop or, or Word, and it slims it down. It takes out all that extra binary code and, and crap that's filling everything up that you don't necessarily need or use, and it cuts it out of the program. So it takes up a lot less space on your hard drive. Um, oh, both wow. of, yeah. And it doesn't change the way the application runs? No, no. Oh, and wow. both of those applications are like 15 bucks. So, you know, they're, they're a good investment for when you get your new laptop with your, with your updated version of OS X on it. I wanted to show you all your updates that you need to run, first of all. So yeah, these are all the updates that you need to do. So it'll take a while to, to kind of run through all of that, clean up your system, and make sure you've got all the most recent versions of software running. All right, so bottom line, I think the main culprit is that you're really running out of hard drive space on your laptop. And that's you know, causing a lot of issues with the virtual memory and just slowing things down completely. Okay. Yep. I'm glad we found the culprit because I sure wouldn't have noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> what I would recommend is to either dump a lot more stuff onto an external hard drive or get a bigger drive just for your computer in general. You know, maybe it's time to upgrade completely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it might be time. Thank well, you. You're welcome. Hopefully this helped. And uh, thanks for getting in touch with us. Thank you so much. More questions for you. Mish writes in, hi. I remember Patrick mentioning something about the display port and somehow it stuck with me that this is the new thing. So when I purchased my new laptop the other day, I was happy to see it came with a display port instead of an HDMI. Problem! My LCD has an HDMI and not a display port. How can I connect my laptop display port to the LCD's HDMI port? Cheers, Mish. Ah, uh, the pain of being an early adopter. Uh, display port and mini display port are kind of the bane of my existence. <laughs> Apple user. Apple notebook, non-Apple monitor. 
problem. Or wanting to use like three monitors with one of the spiffy new so ATI cards graphics don't cards. Fit. They don't. Cards don't fit. You need an adapter. You need I mean, an adapter. Yeah, DisplayPort's the future for a lot of vendors, right? It's a Vasus spec, it's royalty free, it takes up less space on a notebook or a GPU than a DVI port. The, the DisplayPort has ridiculous headroom in terms of bandwidth, um, which is a big deal for running super high resolution displays or multiple super high resolution displays off of the same port. And uh, if your DisplayPort is dual mode, and it mm -hmm. probably is, you can pick up a generic DisplayPort DVI or HDMI adapter online for like 20, 25 bucks, depending yeah. on where you're shopping. Don't buy the Apple one, it's expensive. I, well, Actually, you, I think you have to. Do you yeah. have to? I thought I can't remember if Apple's is the proprietary or I not. I think it is. The mini display port adapter? Yeah, see, we don't have any of those at home. and so we I don't just, have any of those here. So we're going to oh, yes, we do. We have one. If you know where Rob's magic closet is, he's our All right. CTO. Don't well, tell him I said that. Rob, I'm not the guy stealing the Apple power adapters. No. I'm just saying. All right. Well, <laughs> on Twitter, Waris Shaw writes in, is there any major difference between the Western Digital Green 2 terabyte and Black Western Digital 2 terabyte other than the cache size? Oh, do you want to take this one? <laughs> sure, yeah. Speed. Speed. The WD black drives are performance. Green drives are designed to be energy efficient. And the blue drives are their middle of the road. The green drives should consume less energy, generate less heat, and move data slower. OK for a server, not so OK if you're like editing video, for example. And before anybody emails in, we should say, like, OK for a home server, not for like my super critical yeah. high speed <laughs> data server of doom. You don't want the green drives in that. Unless heat's an issue. Yeah, if you're using it in a desktop, though, I'd go with the black. Get the extra speed. Yeah, get the extra speed. All right, we've got one more question Keep from going. Stanley. What up, Zilla Tex? I got a question for you. I just bought myself a Samsung i9000 smartphone, and I wanted to know how long I should charge the battery before I use it. Or should I use it until the battery goes dead and then fully charge it then? What's the standard charging modus operandi for a new device, by the way? I love the show. Keep it up. Thanks. Peace out. Stan. Peace Yo. out. <laughs> yeah, so modern cell phones have pretty sophisticated power management and charging built right into the phone. Yeah. Um, I would say charge it until the battery says it's full. Go use it, plug it back in when you get home, to the office, or in your car. Um, Patrick swears that once a month you should make sure you exercise the battery by charging it to 100%, then running it down all the way. I do that with even my laptop yeah. every month. I actually have it on my calendar to totally discharge the battery and then mm -hmm. recharge it back up all the way. Yeah. Um, that's pretty much all you have to do. It's really weird. Like Pretty much everything now uh, for consumer electronics, lithium ion batteries and charging cycles on lithium ion batteries are cumulative, right? Uh, you know, if you take it, one charging cycle is like 100% usage, which could be 20%, 20%, you know, 20% recharge, 20% recharge, 40% recharge, 20% recharge. That's a charging cycle of 100% or 100% and recharge. So that's, you know, 100% recharge or the, the 20 recharge, 20 recharge, 40 recharge, 20 recharge. Those, each of those are one cycle, and you have a finite number of them in your battery, hopefully 400 or 500. But cell phone manufacturers, Apple, um, pretty much anybody making small consumer electronics, they want you to, they basically, because nobody wants to get their ass kicked the way Apple did over the iPod battery nightmares, mm -hmm. um, so they, they hopefully put a decent lithium ion battery in there and they put the most sophisticated electronics they can get their little grubby paws on to manage the charging on that. So, yeah, <laughs> use it, run it down to zero once a month at least, and you should be good. It can't hurt to just use it until it's yeah. dead all the way yeah. every time. No. No, Can't I don't hurt. see why not. It'll save cycles. Yeah, well, it means 100% oh, yeah. is 100%. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's Math! A, that's the crazy part. Well, but, you know, back in the day, there was all this mythology that was built around, like, the best way to charge your cell phone until mm -hmm. finally some reps from Verizon and other companies started. And Apple, obviously, spent a lot of money on building web pages like, you know, apple.com slash battery because they don't want to get their ass kicked again over another iPod battery issue that, that's like, this is what you should do. This is why. Here's the information. Please don't sue us. So... Coming up, more viewer questions. But first, let's talk about Squarespace. If you haven't seen it, Squarespace is a publishing system. It's a hosting system. It's all in one. It's for anybody looking to build a blog, a portfolio, or any kind of website. Blog tools that allow you to use your iPhone to update on the go, hassle-free importing the sites from that old system you used to use, robust stats, and quite a bit more. Squarespace pretty much makes it super easy, stupid easy, for anybody to build out and maintain a site that you could only dream of or spend a lot of cash to get for a developer on other platforms. And if you got coding 
experience. You don't have to use Squarespace's super cool WYSIWYG make it yourself interface. You can get into the code and customize things even further. Tens of thousands of people all across the internet have been using Squarespace for years and their already great service is only getting better by the day. And we gotta say congratulations to Squarespace because on July 14th, they scored a huge round of capital investment that's gonna allow them to expand at an even faster rate with even better service for you. Congratulations Squarespace, we are truly excited to work with such great people. Do yourself a favor, if you're looking to move your blog or start a blog or start a website or move your website, go to squarespace.com, get the 14 day free trial and if you decide to stay there, and I bet you will, use the promotion code TECHZILLA when you place your order, when you check out, when you put the credit card down, you'll score 10% off the lifetime of your account. Matt writes in, we are a small TV install company and with the permission of our client, we are going to post some of our installs to our site. We wanted to know if there was a tool out there that would batch watermark photos for our security and remove the EXIF data for theirs. Would rather it be free, but as this is a business venture, we expect to pay. Thanks, Matt. Lightroom and Photoshop should be able to do both of those things in case you already happen to have them. <laughs> uh, to strip the EXIF data off of images, just save for web and that'll do it automatically. You can batch watermark by recording a new action in Photoshop of you making the watermark mm -hmm. and then executing the batch operation under the automate menu. Um, but if you don't have Photoshop, here are some other pieces of software that could help. Um, you didn't mention if you're using Windows or Mac, so I just kind of did both. Uh, for Windows, to remove the EXIF data, try Power EXIF. It's, it's 50 bucks but it's supposed to be a really good application. Mm -hmm. It does a lot of different stuff, too. Uh, JSTRIP is one that's free that'll strip all that EXIF data out of there. And also strip file, which is also free. Strip to file. Strip file. It sounds sexy, too. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I took a lot of decongestant today, so I'm a little like, woo! Blame the Sudafed. Yeah. To batch watermark, uh, you might want to try batch watermark creator. That's about 30 bucks from easytools.net. Multiple image resizer does a lot of different things, and that'll also do uh, batch watermarking. It's free for personal use. It's $23 for a single commercial license. And those are all from Windows. Those are all Windows, yes. For Mac to batch watermark, you want to try Easy Batch Photo. It's $23.95, and as it states, it will batch watermark It sounds like things. something you cook a cake or a light bulb with. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's $47.95 for five personal commercial licenses, which is not bad if you've got a few people working for you. No. And for the EXIF data problem, uh, give EXIF tool a try. Now, it's a command line tool that'll work for both Mac and Windows with a standalone Windows executable and a Mac package. Mm -hmm. uh, you might not be feeling quite so adventurous, but it is totally free and it supports just about every file type under the sun. I like that thought. Like every Oops. file type. Not it's okay, you're allowed that. to say it. You're allowed to say it. You're your own man. You don't have to listen to the to the criticisms. But actually, I, I do abuse phrases over nah, and over again. Whatever, who cares? Joe writes in. <laughs> we'll watch one of your shows. App Zapper was mentioned. I was excited about it and looked it up only to find out that it is for Mac. I'm a Windows 7 user and would like to know if there's anything that is equal or compares to App Zapper for Windows. Too many times my wife and kids come to me telling me about a program they installed that puts something else on their computers. Joe in Heron, Illinois. So yeah, we've recommended this application a few times. The <laughs> Revo Uninstaller for Windows yes. is a really great pot product. Um, I'd say it's the closest thing to App Zapper for Windows that I can think of. Mm -hmm. It'll take out file associations, COM components, Ooh. Windows installer components, program settings, <laughs> and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah. Um, if you're not happy with that one, there are loads of other uninstallers out there for Windows, actually. The list kind of goes on and hundreds, on. Hundreds, perhaps Dozens even of thousands. <laughs> I guess the uh, built-in uninstallers just aren't enough sometimes. Well, they tend to be a little sloppier than you you'd like at yeah. times. They yeah. just sort of, well, well, you don't need to erase that. And we'll just leave it there forever. sometimes, yeah, they don't want certain things uninstalled. Dun, dun, dun. However, it sounds like you may be downloading a bunch of barnacles, <laughs> uh, software being packaged with the application you actually want it. That's my new term for it. Barnacles. barnacles. I like that. And you it's know. It's like bloatware. Barnacles because well, they latch on to the other application. Right. There's like free software that installs a mm -hmm. search toolbar that you don't want to use or let's say your drivers from a certain vendor for your new graphics card installs a giant pile of crap you didn't want in there. Choose the custom installation and basically uncheck everything yeah. you don't want. Pay really close attention yeah. when you're installing that software. Uh, they'll all actually often ask you if it's okay if they can install like the new Yahoo toolbar. Or the Alexa or toolbar. Gorilla or Gorilla Buddy. Or the Weasel 4000. Don't say Gorilla Buddy, but you weep. <laughs> <laughs> Just say no to bloat, say no people. Say no to the bloat. Something I forgot to ask, Lori, I'm going to ask everybody out there. 
Windows 7 and RAW files seems to be a nightmare. I've got a, I pulled a whole bunch of RAW images off my camera. I'm trying to get them to actually show natively Windows 7, at least for Canon, there doesn't seem to be any software. If you've got a way to get my RAW files to show up inside of Windows 7 so I can view them in the photo viewer, do me a favor, email us techzilla at revision3.com. Now, I want to tell you about another show on the network. You ever see a video on YouTube and wonder, how did they do that? Wonder No More is one of Revision 3's newest shows. Joe Genius is lifting the shroud from around the best science videos online and showing you why they work, or more often, why they didn't. Join host Jonah Ray for the new episodes of Joe Genius every Thursday. Revision3.com slash Joe Genius is the place to find them. It's fun stuff. For all of you watching, we live on your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how-tos, you ask us, we'll do it. Especially if they're food related, but we need those emails, so don't be shy. Send them into techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us in a video question. It's been, it's been so been a long. long time. It's been a long time, people. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, or comments with other fans of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Until next time, you've been watching Techzilla. Bye. <laughs> edit that out. Mauricio can fix that. Mauricio can fix anything. No, Jordan. Sorry, Jordan. Jordan, you can fix anything. Petronica! That's a first. It's like a bottle of tequila with attitude. So pull out the cellular. What's the best way to charge your telephone? Telephone. Veronica, it's contagious. I have it this week. Too many times my wife finds to come to what the hell was. I think it's sentence? supposed to be wife and kids. I don't know how kids got cut out. <laughs> my wife does what? <laughs> I don't want emails about that ever. <laughs> Da 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 da. Rogers, a mean producer. Da 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 da. <laughs> and oh, then he makes the dollar problems disappear again. <laughs>